basically come to the conclusion that cholesterol is actually probably quite good for us, you know, and it's not as bad as we, we thought. So, what really does cause heart disease? What is it? Okay, so there's three different ideas that I want to discuss of what, what really causes heart disease. And in order to do that, I'm going to go into each one in a bit of detail and then I'm going to give you some examples at the end of, of actual studies that have been done to, sh to show actual techniques that we can use right now, which every, the skills that everyone has right now, um, to help combat um, heart disease. Okay, so, so we've got the response to injury theory, we've got the con sugar consumption theory, and we've got, you know, the lovely stress that everyone seems to feel a lot more these days. Um, you know, we've also already shown in the previous slides that sugar could have a powerful effect on heart disease. We've already proven that. So I'm going to go into details on the mechanism why that happens as well. But first, let's go into the response to injury theory. So this is what the response to injury theory is. So a factor or a series of factors damages the endothelium of the artery wall. So, okay, we've got these coronary arteries that supply the blood to the heart. So a factor or a series of factors is damaging the endothelium artery wall, okay? And you need to, it's, it's good to understand this so you, you know what really is causing heart disease. And this stimulates, as we discussed before, blood clot to form over the area of damage, and the endothelium then regrows over the blood clot to repair the damage, okay? The blood clot is removed and broken down by white blood, white blood cells, but if this carries on and on and on, okay, as we discussed before, um, and more clots get drawn into the artery wall, a plaque eventually grows and breaks off and you get a heart attack. So that's, that's something we talked about before. So there's an injury that's going on, some factors causing an injury to the, the, to the wall. Yes? Can I just ask, I mean, could the injury be things like bumping or something? Yeah, because physical trauma will um, so you can damage your heart. Yeah, good. What do you mean actually injure your bruise yeah, your heart? Your heart but let's say like you bump your leg you get a bit bruised. Yeah. So then that uh, artery is damaged and it yes. cholesterol and blah blah blah. And then a little bit breaks off and travels yeah. in your bloodstream. Well one of the um, things if you if you see a lot of people who have um, had uh, car crashes, severe car crashes. Mm -hmm. Uh, they end up in hospital. One of the first medications they put them on is a blood thinner, an anticoagulant, yeah. because what happens is you get massive inflammation, right? That massive inflammation. Think about what happens when you have a bruise. That's what's happening inside your arteries, okay? But if that happens in um, another part of your body, like your legs, that can actually, uh, that overinflammation can turn into thrombus, exactly the same mechanism, break off and cause, it's why, you know, they, they recommend taking an aspirin when you go for a flight on the plane, because what happens is, some people get blood clots form in their legs, and then that goes up and causes an embolism, okay? An embolism is when the thrombus breaks off and gets you. So, there's lots of ways you can get uh, blood clots, there's lots of different ways. But in the heart, they're saying there's a factor, or a series of factors that's causing this damage. Okay, so, so they're saying that, that heart disease is caused by a series of factors that's causing injury. Okay? Now what are these factors? So the factors that can damage the wall is high blood pressure. So things that cause high blood pressure can, um, can cause a damage. Because say if the blood vessels are constricted okay, um, and the blood's flowing through, because like, it flows as a pulse, right? it's flowing through, uh, under a lot more pressure, it can cause that pressure can cause a damage to the um, walls. Okay, um, so there's lots of things that can cause high blood pressure. Like smoking, for example, can cause high blood pressure. Stress can cause high blood pressure. Lots of there's lots of you know cocaine can cause high blood pressure. You know lots of drugs. Um, there's a whole wide you know variety of um, things that can cause that. Diabetes and high sugar levels in the blood. So you know we we're talking about diabetes causing heart disease. Too much sugar in the blood can also damage the walls. Okay? Then there's this whole idea of free radicals forming. You know, free radicals that we get from um, 
eating junk food and you know and stress and you know there's there's a whole wide amount of research on free radical formation as well that you can go and look up. Uh, I won't go into that too much detail. And you know they say the antioxidants actually protect you against free radicals forming. So um, that's where this whole antioxidant idea comes from. That it protects against free radicals forming and one of the free radicals, actually, this comes back to this convoluted theory that um, LDL, cholesterol, causes heart disease. So what they say is not actually LDL, it's actually oxidised LDL, right? So oxidised LDL is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is where the normal bad cholesterol, that we call bad cholesterol, LDL, has been oxidised, um, where it's um, gone under a chemical change in the area, okay? And that, that oxidised form of it is what damages the wall, okay? And antioxidants supposedly protect against this oxidised version of LDL, okay? Um, and it's just so complicated, this whole idea. It's very difficult to really get your head around. It's, it's you know, it's not... No one's sure. No, these are all ideas. No one's actually really proved any of this. And so the, the other idea is, you know, what the government says, possibly LDL. But the problem here is that heart disease is found both in people with low and high LDL levels. So how can, you know, how can it be the LDL? Um, and this is another one. Arteries and veins both get the same exposure to LDL, right? But only arteries get arteriosclerosis. Veins don't. So going by this whole LDL causing damage idea, okay? Because what, what the original idea is that high cholesterol builds up in, in the arteries and causes blocks. So now the response to injury thing is that it's a factor causing damage. So the idea is maybe LDL does it, but it can't be because you've got LDL in the veins and veins don't get any um, arteriosclerosis. Okay, so that throws LDL out of the picture. Now let's go on to the sugar conspiracy. This is very interesting. Because sugar does cause damage to cell walls in high concentrations. It, you know, it's proof shown in diabetes. Anyone who's diabetic will, will know, know about this as well. So this began 30 year, years ago with the famous President Richard Nixon, who's very paranoid, always very paranoid. Um, and he wanted food to be less expensive so he could win the re-election. This was one of the ways that he won that re-election, okay, was by making food really cheap. So the way he did this was he bought high fructose corn syrup from the Japanese. The Japanese were like, we don't want this stuff, you can have it really cheap. Okay, because we know that this is evil. Alright? So that Japanese brought it over to USA, USA and it started replacing natural sugar because it was so much sweeter and so much cheaper. Right? So they only had to use a little amount of it. Okay? So he was like, right, let's get this into all the food. Let's get H. You know, and that will make all the food a lot cheaper. But it's quite strange as well that we had this fat craze suddenly emerge as well at around the same sort of time. And everyone latched on to Ansel Keys's idea that um, saturated fat causes heart disease. Everyone latched on to that one. You know, all the big companies, all the corporations. So everything went low fat. All the food suddenly went low fat overnight, okay? Now the thing is, low fat food tastes absolutely horrible. Yes. I mean, we all know that. Yes. Okay? Yes. Yeah. And you eat and, and the thing is with low fat food as well, okay, they tend to strip out the fibre as well. Okay? So having no fibre in food and no fat, um, it just it's just you're left with like a nothingness, okay? With not much cal calorie value to it. Okay? And um, trying to get people to eat that is going to be very difficult because it's going to taste absolutely nasty. So what they did was they put HFCS, high fructose corn syrup, in all of that low fat food. So they replaced the fat with the sugar. Okay. So now high fructose corn syrup consumption is now up by ten thousand percent. Okay. It's in the Japanese economy. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. They got their own back. <laughs> So, high fructose corn syrup is pretty much found in everything that you, you find. All the fizzy drinks have got it in there. Um, pretty much anything that says low fat has got high fructose corn syrup in it. Okay? 
Okay, all these Weight Watcher meals, you know, that's supposed to be so good for you, they've all got this stuff in it, which is deadly. And I'll tell you why this is deadly in a second. Right, sugar consumption, excessive sugar consumption goes hand in hand with excessive belly fat growth, right? It goes hand in hand with it. Now I'll tell you why that happens. When you eat food, it enters your gut where it gets digested and it then goes into your small bowel, right? And some of it's absorbed back through the walls and um, there, there's a vein called the portal vein which transports it to the liver, right? This is a very, very important vein. You could, you could remember the portal vein. If it's good, healthy food, your liver's happy, and then it takes it to other places around your body for nourishment to fill, to your cells, okay? If it's bad food, your liver actually gets toxic with it, it gets overloaded, and it churns out bad fats like LDL. This is the hypothesis that it's, your liver gets toxic, and it starts churning out these bad fats, okay? I actually don't agree with this. This is actually from somebody called Dr. Oz, who is a very prominent, um, very famous cardiologist from America, and he also... Um, Oprah's doctor. He's Oprah's, yeah, he's on the Oprah, he's famous on that. He makes this thing up about LDL, about LDL, and that kind of, you know, I'm going to be controversial here, and I think it's because he had, because he's so much in the public light, if he was to say LDL doesn't cause heart disease or something else, he would be shot, he wouldn't be walking around, do you know what I mean? Because all the drug companies would be like, Whoa, what, wait here. So he's come up with this idea that it churns out bad fats like LDL. But it does actually churn out a version of LDL which is bad, which is a very, very low density lipid protein. Okay, and that causes this thing called metabolic syndrome when, it, when it's in high concentrations. But it's confusing for people to, because there's so many different types of LDL, it's confusing to tell people that it's just LDL. Do you know, you've got to be specific what it is, because the public are under this notion that LDL is cholesterol, and cholesterol is found in food with fat, so therefore it's really bad for you. Okay, whereas really it isn't. It's much more complicated. Okay, um, so what happens is this bad fat supposedly gets stored in um, belly fat cells, which is known as the omentum fat here. Okay, and that's what increases your waist size. Over time, that gets more and more toxic, okay, over, over, over the years, and that starts churning more toxic chemicals into your liver through the portal vein, and then it just becomes a cycle of, of negativity, and, um, and you end up getting this thing called metabolic syndrome, which causes diabetes, high blood pressure, and all sorts of and obesity, and all sorts of other things, okay? Now, let's have a look at what's really going on in terms of the biology. Now fructose, which is found in high fructose corn syrup, okay, is actually only metabolized by the liver, right? And it's very similar to ethanol in the way it's um, metabolized by the body and the way it works, okay? And what it does to the body. It's basically, it's actually like alcohol but without a high, because it's not metabolized in the brain, right? It's metabolized everywhere else and not in the brain. So you don't get the drunk feeling, but you do get the feel-good feeling. Of alcohol. So it confuses the liver and ends up making, um, well the thing is that the liver likes glucose. That is a good um, calorie to consume. Glucose is our natural calorie. Um, but fructose on the other hand, especially in really high concentrations, which you find in high fructose corn syrup, is not great. The liver doesn't like it so much. Okay. And it actually ends up making all these bad fats, as we were talking about before. And the thing with fructose is that it actually doesn't signal your brain that you're full, right? Whereas glucose does, right? It doesn't actually signal. In, in, in high fructose corn syrup, especially in food that has no fibre, because fibre, what fibre does is actually when it reaches your colon, right, um, it actually signals your brain that you're full up. That's another part of the mechanism of fibre, okay? Whereas in all this low-fat, fibreless food, which is full of high fructose corn syrup, you're not getting told that you're full. That's why you can eat like a Big Mac and drink a whole super-sized meal and still feel hungry, you know? Um, and that's why Americans eat so much junk they can consume it. Naturally, it's not possible because there's no fiber in there and it's full of this bad sugar. 
you never get signaled that you're full. Or you just carry on eating, eating, eating. Right? So uh, there you go. So that's that's what's happening with fructose. Okay? It doesn't sound very nice, does it? Can I just ask a question? Yeah. The fructose I know you're saying there is the one that's in um, yeah. the syrup. How does that relate to the fructose you naturally find in okay, food? Okay, this is what I was going to come on to next. Yeah. Right. Basically, fructose naturally in food, right, has the antidote. Because fruit has fibre. Okay, so what happens is you eat fibre, a lot of fibre, signals your colon, you're full up, right, so you stop eating it. Okay, whereas the problem with refined food is that there's no fibre, so you, you never feel that you're full up. That's why you can e easily eat a whole packet of chop, um, biscuits. It's refined, full of high fructose corn syrup, doesn't tell you you're full up. And naturally, if you consume that many calories, if you ate that much glucose, right, you, would, you wouldn't be able to eat more than a couple of those biscuits. Do you know what I mean? But you can easily eat a whole packet of them, because it's the wrong type of sugar. Oh, easily. Yeah. <laughs> easily, right? So we're, it's totally one. Eating artificial food from the factory is not natural. And this is why it's not natural. This is why our body doesn't like it. It's why our body can't register. You know that the, the, this is actually um, making us full. So we just keep eating, eating, eating. So how do you know if you have too much belly fat? Okay, belly fat is is a problem. It, it is a problem because it gets toxic and it you know. So how do we know we have too much belly fat? What you have to do is get a tape measure up, put it around your belly button, okay? And the waist measurement should be half of your height in inches. So, say you're about six foot, your waist should no, not be any more than 36 inches. Okay? So, that's a very important point here. I'm more. <laughs> so, you know, go home and do that on your, you know, your husbands, yourselves, whoever. And do, do, being a yoga teacher, you should know exactly how to get rid of this and strengthen the core. It's all about the core. Okay? Um, it is very difficult. It's the hardest. Um, and detox the liver, basically. Exactly. Detoxification of the liver is the easiest way to it lose this weight. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. So. Belly fat's also so bulky, right, they actually compress on your kidneys, right? So you know those people with food and all like that? It actually presses on your kidneys, and this can disrupt their function and make your blood pressure go up too, right? So belly fat's horrible, nasty stuff. We shouldn't have big bellies on it, it's not, it's not normal. He says this in the house all the time, it is yeah. dead in mother. Mom, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to stress. Now stress, I personally believe, a stress of any form, okay, whether it's physical or emotional, okay, is the prime cause of heart disease. A stress of, of either physical or emotional form is what creates the factors that cause damage in this response to injury or hypothesis. Okay? Stress is just huge right now, you know, it's a very big problem. I mean, working in a pharmacy, at least one in three, one in four people, I, I find, are on depress uh, antidepressants. Okay, you wouldn't go on them if you weren't stressed, would you? So there's a big problem with stress. And this could be an explanation at why um, immigrant populations like uh, immigrant Indians come over to this country, they struggle fitting in, socially dislocated, you know, all these, all these things. I'm going to go into that in a bit more detail next. But let's have a look at the types of stress that we have. Okay, there's something called eustress, um, or healthy stress, known as healthy stress, which is stuff like exercise, massage, sauna, and doing something really exhilarating, like going on a road coaster ride, okay? So, they're forms of good stress, okay? Because if you don't have any stress, if you need to have some stress in your life, otherwise you probably wouldn't do anything, you just sit around. So, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, these sort of things, you know, they're, they're, there's, they're, those, those sort of things are going to create a, a positive stress response in the body. Positive response, okay? And which is very different to what harmful stress causes. 
So, unhealthy stress. Okay, let's have a look at unhealthy stress. Stuff, stuff like job dissatisfaction. I know a person myself, hating my job as a pharmacist, I went through the most incredible like, pain and stress working in a pharmacy. And I mean, I'll be totally open with you, I've actually got a chronic illness as well. It's one of the reasons I got motivated into uh, getting into this sort of stuff is because I started developing something called ulcerative colitis, which is very much linked to stress, okay? And I hated my job, and I was always angry and really scared and fearful of going to work and making, you know, it's just horrible. So, job dissatisfaction, big, big problem, you know? And come on, Matt, who likes their jobs these days? I, I don't know many people. I do. I do. <laughs> 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 Uh, let's, let's not discount you guys, but I'm sure you meet a lot of people who come to your classes yeah. and complain yeah. about their jobs. Yeah. Working corporations, mm -hmm. literally like you know, animals in a farm, you know, just mm -hmm. yeah, it's just it's, there's a big problem with, with our job dissatisfaction at the moment. Financial problems, we're going through a recession right now, you know. There's a lot of worries, people getting their house repossessed, left, right and centre. You know, these these sort of things are causing a lot of stress. Um, stuff like steroid use. Steroid use is proven to create um, a, a massive stress response okay, in the body. And I'm going to go into what stress does in the body in a bit, but lots of people die of heart disease and heart attacks uh, who abuse steroids. Okay? Diseases such as diabetes, they create stress in the body. Okay? Too much sugar. Smoking causes stress. Bullying causes stress. Um, you know, if, if your kid's getting bullied at school, he's probably under a lot of stress. You know, he may not admit that he's getting bullied at school because he's scared. Mm -hmm. He or she, you know. Um, I work. 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 Kids are going under a lot of stress now. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 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 Oh, corp corporate bullying. Yeah. 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 I've experienced it up in yeah. head office uh, that I was working in as well. So, you know, no, no, internet bullying, not internet bullying. Yeah. 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 Bullying is a big problem. There's a lot of competition, it's very competitive. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And the biggie social dislocation, separation from your normal communities. So that's one of the explanations why immigrant Asians, Native Americans, um, Aborigines, you know, the Russians as well, who've been overturned so many times, have such high incidences of heart disease, okay? It's a big problem, you know, being separated um, from your natural everyday life and then having to start all over again causes stress. Even within a country. People yes. 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 Yeah. Well, they say moving houses are one of the yeah, biggest stress stresses yeah. you can go for, isn't it? And just imagine having your house repossessed and then having to move. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So let's have a look. What happens during an unhealthy stress response? Okay. Right. Well, what happens is a release of stress hormones is controlled. So let's just talk to the, about the body first. The release of stress hormones, the, the hormones that, that initiate a stress response, is controlled by the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland together in unison. Okay? So under stress, what happens is your hypothalamus signals the pituitary gland to release hormonal messengers to your adrenal glands to release adrenaline and cortisol. Okay? So the adrenaline and cortisol are the two most important hormones that you want to, you want to um, remember. And this is known as the HPA axis, or the hypothalamus pituitary gland adrenal axis. Okay, it's quite a long one, so short sure to HPA, it's easier to remember. So, what does this... Um, okay, sorry, so, let's go back. 
So what you, what you have is two different uh, ner parts of your nervous system. You have the sympathetic nervous system and your parathematic nervous system. So when you're under stress, your sympathetic nervous system is switched on. Okay? That's what happens. So the sympath uh, sympathetic deals with flight or fight. So it prepares you for battle. That's what it does. It gets you ready for battle. And this is what happens, um, and usually, normally, this is actually a good thing, you know, if you're in under danger, this is a good thing, it's, it's, it's a part of a natural defence mechanism. So what it does, it speeds up your heart rate, and redirects blood away from your gut to your muscles, okay? That's why, um, you know, say you, you do a massive, long exercise, workout, you don't feel hungry for ages, you know what I mean? Because all, all the um, blood flow is going away from your gut and going to your muscles. It stimulates your liver to release glucose, so you get higher blood glucose levels, um, which explains, you know, diabetes, there are a lot of stress, and triggers the release of various blood clotting factors. Okay, that's in, that's very important. Release of various blood clotting factors. What causes, um, you know, the, the problem, the block, is because of a blood clot. Okay, so. This is all good if, if you're just getting stressed every now and then, like, and, or if it's fun stress, okay, that's, that's cool. But if that's going on for all the time, you're under stress all the time, as people are, um, you know, working in very confined corporate competitive environments, smoking excessively, drinking heavily, you know, things like that, um, eating too much sugar, which all causes um, this to be switched on more of the time. Okay, so these are the consequences of a dysfunctional HV axis. Now, Cushing syndrome is one extreme example of your body under extreme stress, causing this HPA axis to go completely out of sync um, and produce excess cortisol. So Cushing syndrome generally happens to people who take steroids for a long time. Okay? Because steroids basically put your body under a lot of stress for a long time, okay? And uh, then you get this thing called Cushing syndrome. And it's it's pretty much what happens. If you look at um, immigrant Indians, for example, they tend to have this pot belly, right? A lot of them used to tend to be a bit nursed over a bit. Um, and they often have diabetes. Diabetes is very common amongst immigrant Indians. And they have heart disease. So they're pretty much getting this cushion syndrome sort of effect going on, okay? So, you know, that somebody with a large belly, okay? Having diabetes and heart disease is a sign of somebody who's under a lot of stress in their body. Okay? Depression is another example of initiator of HPA axis dysfunction. Right? And this is from a, um, a study that was done by Kunogi. They said, and this was the neuropsychopharmacy, it was published in that, it was a very prominent um, paper uh, in January 2006. There's compelling evidence for the involvement of the HPA axis abnormalities in depression. So they're saying that, that depression causes an HPA abnormality. Now, in my opinion, you don't need to be a scientist to work that out. It's quite obvious, if you're depressed, you're going to be more stressed, and that's going to be... Yeah. Smoking is also proven to disrupt the HPA axis, although it's not as chronic as depression, unless you're smoking like 20, 30 a day. All right? Can I just say that also have this HPA plays a role in um, Alzheimer's because the race of cortisol gets to the brain and starts breaking apart the, the neural connection. Yeah, totally, totally. I think any disease is going to be affected by any chronic condition is going to be affected, well, initiated by a disruption in this first. That's my 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 hypothesis is that any chronic disease we have, whether it's diabetes, ulcerative colitis, Alzheimer's, dementia, any of those things, is first initiated by a disruption in the HPA axis. And I'll tell you why, through anecdotal evidence, why I 100% stand by that. So let's have a look at stress as an emotion. What, let's be human about this now. Let's, I've, I've done a lot of clinical stuff. Let's actually look at this as a human perspective, like right? what do we feel when we're stressed? We tend to feel things like apathy, fear, anger, and frustration. Would that, you know, would you say that they're classic things? Is that what you feel when you're stressed? Yeah. 
And what do you feel, you know, when there's any stress? What sort of things do you feel? Like, you know, is that, is, would you feel joy, contentment, peace, you know? After you've done a nice session of yoga, do you not feel these things, right? So what are the, let's look at in terms of emotions. How can we raise your emotions to the higher energies of joy and peace rather than fear and anger? What are the things that we can do? I want to ask. Exercise. Meditate. Yoga. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right? Everyone in this room has this skill, you know, developed. So we are armed with better drugs, okay, personal human drugs, okay, that, that we deliver every day through our energy um, as yoga teachers with no side effects, okay, that can help people reduce heart disease, okay. So yoga, you know, meditation, what, what other things raise your emotions? What other things do you do raise your emotions to a better level? What, let's, let's, let's... Meditation, something. Laughing, laughing. laughter, laughing. brilliant. Laughing. Music, music, brilliant. Nature, yes, getting back to nature. Gardening. Eating chocolate. Now you've just got a mood. No, do you know what? We're in the entire now. No, I have to totally actually agree with you there. Because you can get chocolate that isn't full of high fructose corn syrup. You can get raw cocoa based chocolate which tastes just as good. Chocolate actually has an amazing positive effect on the body. It's packed full of um, beneficial uh, antioxidants and things that increase our dopamine levels. And it's even got a molecule in it, I cannot pronounce the name, um, it's something like ad ad adamantanine or something like that, or adamantanide, something like that, which actually is what makes us feel in love, right? It's like, it's like oxytocin. I can really be limited to dark chocolate. <laughs> 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 I'm really in love with that. I would say so. Yes. Well, the more yeah. the chocolate, raw chocolate that's in there, Better. So, if you go to Thornton or something like yeah. that, and they're, they're not really properly handmade, right? Okay. You want to go to something like Peru and have proper like, raw chocolate, or import it, right? Yeah. Or make your own, learn how to make your own raw chocolate. Can, can I just ask you something as a workshop? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. No, don't. Just because of the disease, and that, that just struck me as. No, no, that raises dopamine levels. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, don't, you don't find dopamine in the chocolate, but it no, raises your energy. Yeah. 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 Oh, I think chocolate is a brilliant thing, and you should not stop eating chocolate. Just stop eating the oh, pastries and the cake. Neera, she's <laughs> been very honest about her love for chocolates, and honesty is the best way to combat stress. <laughs> it is. It is. Talking about your emotions, you know? That's, that's another one, laughter. Talking yes. about your, your, your problems, talking it through. A lot of people suppress. Yeah. Everything inside, you know, and one of the things that I found my patients, okay, and this is what was I've, I know I've got dozens and dozens of testimonials and letters of patients who have completely come off their medication and become better, you know. One of the things they said to me was, Oh my god, what a relief! Somebody who actually listens because what they found was that they'll go to the doctor, right. And the doctor would just rush them out. And in some cases, the doctor had already written a prescription before mm -hmm. they sat down. Right? And it's not always the fault of the doctor. I think a lot of it's down to the fact we have this NHS system and it's just too busy, too overloaded, too, and they're just too busy and too tired. So drugs are an easy way out. Right? And um, some people demand prescriptions, don't they? Some people yeah, don't they do. satisfied if they yeah. leave it without something 100%. in their house. Yeah, hypochondria. Yeah. 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 You're so right, you're so right, you know, and this all does require work, you know, raising your emotional level consistently does require some effort. So it's easier to take a drug in some cases, you know, like if you're depressed, you go and take a pill to raise your, make you feel better, right? But that, those things are not going to be long-lasting. Pills, any drug in your body for a long period of time causes other stress factors to build up. So we've got to we've got to move away from drugs that make us feel good, okay? And 
sugar that makes us feel good. We've got to move away from that to more natural ways of feeling good. We have to do that, otherwise we're going to have a massive epidemic. Um, and I think it's just waiting. It's just around my generation is really screwed. Um, if they don't do something about it, um, you know, of, of, of heart disease, it's going to be huge. It's going to be crazy because we're all consuming more sugar than ever before. Kids at the age of, you know, 16, 17 are binge drinking like crazy. Um, they're drinking. We, we need you guys to be healthy to pay for our yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Or for our pension. Yeah. Exactly. Red, Red Bulls are major. Red Bull, Red Bull and vodka, that is just pure, you know, sugar, pure heart rate back in the glass. So, you know, there's all sorts of things that are going on. And I think we need to look at things in terms of an emotion now. How can we help people raise their emotions consistently? You know, yoga is something you can do every day for free, naturally, that gives you exercise, it gives you your air, oxygen back to your system. Oxygen protects you from stress because you need oxygen, a vital substance. If you don't breathe properly, like I am right now, you know, if you, some of you talk about so much, if you, don't, if you don't breathe right, you don't breathe deep, and Amikaji will totally, you know, vouch for this, you know, that leads to so much toxic build-up in your body of excess, um, I mean, you, you know this more than me, you get more carbon dioxide, is it, build up and then that leads to other things. An you acid. need carbon dioxide to build up. You need your carbon need that. dioxide to yeah. build up. Otherwise, your body can't absorb the oxygen you're breathing in. So they all know this. So you breathe out for longer than you breathe in. But what's the consequences of let not breathe, shallow breathing? What was it? Stress. Stress. Causes stress. stress. Yeah. yeah. So because you're, you're suppressing the oxygen from your vital organs, aren't you? So. So, you know, there's all these sort of things that we can do to increase our emotional state. Lots of things. And I just want to give you some actual evidence, now clinical evidence, to support our case that yoga, meditation, and natural things are, are, are just as beneficial, if not way more beneficial, than drugs. And this crazy idea that cholesterol causes heart disease. Okay. Here is a study published in the Journal of the Association of Physicians in India. JAPI established the reversibility of heart disease through yoga. Okay? Study was on an angiographic ally proven uh, CAD patients of whom 71 formed the study group and 42 the control group. The results proved that the serum total cholesterol levels had reduced by 23.3%, disease had regressed in 43.7%, and the progression was arrested in another 46.5% of the patients. Some marked improvements were noticed in anxiety levels of patients. Controlled yoga combining com calming and stimulating measures resulted in reduced serum cholesterol, LDL and triglyceride levels. Okay? So Not even by then you shouldn't see okay. It's great. What this is just one study, there's loads <laughs> of this. You just go on to PubMed. There's tons of these studies where yoga, meditation, um, and exercise and you know all these things have produce a good long-lasting um, prevention against heart disease okay now I personally believe the reason why these LDLs and cholesterols go down is because I think cholesterol is high in people who are under stress okay and that cholesterol is actually part of the repair mechanism because cholesterol is needed to repair the cells right so I think cholesterol can be high in some people who are under stress for a long period of time. Okay? So it's just an indicator of something going wrong, not the cause. That's what I'm trying to get at. Another one, and this is my favourite one because I, I am a musician, I'm into sound therapy and music therapy. That's what I've moved in towards. And I'm trying to make sound and music as my medium um, to help people rather than the drugs because I think it's probably going to have more of a benefit in the long run. Okay? Now, listening to music may benefit patients who suffer, suffer from severe stress and anxiety associated with having um, and undergoing treatment for coronary heart disease. A Cochrane systematic review found that listening to music could decrease blood pressure, heart rate, and the levels of anxiety in heart patients. Okay? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, it's not just any particular type of music, it's going to be music you love. Right? If, you, if you play somebody 
meditation music, but they hate it. Okay? It's going to have the opposite effect. It's going to be music. Well, you've got to love the music. You've got to have a passion. So it's passion, passion. It's all about passion. You know, you're going to have a passion for life again. And um, you know, maybe one of the things that we can do as yoga teachers is to give people the passion back in their life. You know, try and help people get more passion in their life, a reason to live again. Okay. And I'll go into why this is very important in, in the next slide. So just going back to this again, the research has reviewed data from 23 studies, which together included 1,461 patients. Two, two studies focused on patients treated by trained music therapists, but most did not using instead interventions where patients listened to pre-recorded musical CDs offered by healthcare professionals. So this is quite a, you know, a good study, it's a long last study, it proves it. And finally people are, are looking at things like um, in a holistic way, holistic therapies, energy therapies, um, in a clinical way and start to get some good results. So the last thing, and this is a phenomenon, this is a very true phenomenon, proven phenomenon. Your coronary arteries actually can adapt to the damaged area. So if you get a damaged area, okay, it can actually grow new coronary arteries around that area. Right? And the cells that also starve oxygen can actually survive a very long time, many years, okay, undamaged and not actually die, right? But some, something happens where they decide that they want to die. Something in them finally goes, sorry guys, I've had enough, I've had enough of you, you know, all the crap you're throwing at me, I want to die, right, I've had enough. No one actually knows what makes them choose to die or live. So do you, do you guys have an idea of what maybe that could be? Joy. Emotion. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I think it's an emotional thing again. It's mm -hmm. when you're living with passion, when you're living with you know heart and passion, you, you, you're living with purpose and meaning, okay? That's when you, you can you can pretty much overcome anything, I think, that's thrown at you. You know, the world's always going to throw you problems all the time. Mm -hmm. If you're living with passion, meaning and purpose, and, and in a way that is actually contributing more, you know, back, and you're growing continuously with it, then the more you take, I think then, then you get this flow where you're actually, it's like a cosmic flow of energy where you're, you know, the energy you're giving out, you know, comes back to you, just, you know, mm -hmm. yes. in the same way. And that energy keeps you going.